2024 and we are gathering to worship and to seek his face this morning so it is good to see you we want to remind you that today is first Sunday so we will have lunch after the service and you are definitely welcome to come and join us for that next Sunday we have a church board meeting after our morning worship so be aware of that our Wednesday discipleship is back in our regular schedule and we have all age groups, so you're welcome to come for that as well. And then if anybody would like to take home one of those beautiful poinsettias that were part of our Christmas decor, they are in the fellowship hall and they are free to a good home. So feel free to take one if that is you. Well, this morning as we do open our hearts to worship, if you will stand and on the back of your bulletin, you will find today's scripture, Isaiah 60. And I invite you to worship with us by reading the scriptures in bold. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises to shine upon you. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth. But the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. Look and see, for they all gather together. Your sons are coming from distant lands. Your little daughters will be carried home. Your eyes will shine and your heart will thrill with joy. For merchants from around the world will come to you. They will bring you the wealth of many lands. Herds of camels will cover your land, the camels of Midian and Judah. The people of Sheba will bring gold and frankincense and will come proclaiming the praise of the Lord. This is the word of God. Good morning and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Every time I say that, I feel like the Jack in the Box from the Island of Misfit Toys. Does that date me? Might date you too if you knew what I was saying. So great to start the year in worship with you today. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are indeed thankful to gather in your house, together with your people, to worship you. Today we pray, Holy Spirit, come. Empower us with your strength to give to God the worship that only He deserves. Help us to glorify your name here and in everything we do after we leave this place today. We ask your blessing upon this year, and this year in worship, we pray, inhabit our praise, and use our time of gathering to build us up into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, that we may be Christ in our world, to the glory of God. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Got a couple of ones that uh, some of y'all may know, but they're easy to pick up if you don't. Page four. Starting with page four. <clears throat>
are turning to page 600. 600. to come and wait upon us for our morning tithes and offerings. Thank you and thank you. Let's pray together today. Our gracious Father, who has given to us everything, certainly every good gift we know, thank you for allowing us in token to give back to you, participating in your work in our world. We pray, bless those who come and give, and then we pray, make us as a body good stewards, using these resources responsibly to do your work in our community and our world. Thank you again for all you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
finish off with 136. 136. struggling without mom. dinner time today. <laughs> it is great to see you. Great to see you. Hey, Miss Michelle is ready. So if you are three years old through sixth grade, it is your time. Hearing their laughs as they go down the hall. I don't know if y'all can hear that over the foot stomps. The ha, ha, ha. Makes me think of that. Enter his gates with praise, you know. So, man, it is good to be here and good to worship the Lord with y'all. So why don't y'all stand up and shake a hand and give a hug.
It certainly strikes me that y'all are glad to be together. Amen. That's a good thing. I wonder this morning as we turn our hearts toward prayer, if you'd be thinking of prayer requests that you might have. Remember those in our world suffering from war and fighting natural disasters. Be much in prayer for our leaders those who serve in our armed forces, our law enforcement agents, and first responders. Continue to pray for Dorothy and Reddick and Brenda and Tammy, for Bailey and Carly and Andy and Betty Jo, for Edna, for Clara, for Ann, for Miles, for Marilyn, for Valier, for Johnny's mother, for a person I know through work, Carlos and his family, for Don and Patty who are not with us today, they had to travel for an unexpected funeral in Dayton, Tennessee today. Are there others that you would mention to us? Unspoken prayer request this morning, you might want to indicate. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, today we come before you thanking you that you hear us when we pray. That when there is no one else that we can call on, we can call on you. Knowing that you hear and answer prayer, knowing that our world changes because we ask from you. And so today, in obedience, we come before you humbly as your people, begging to see your hand at work in our world. There are so many in our world, and we see their faces in the news. We see the bombed out remains of their homes. We see the buildings shattered by earthquakes and tidal waves. And we don't know what to do except cry out to you on their behalf. Lord, have mercy. We pray for those in power in our world, especially the leaders of our nation, that there might be justice and peace in our earth. We pray for those who serve in our armed forces, our soldiers and sailors, our airmen and marines and coast guard. We pray for their protection. We thank you for those who serve us as law enforcement agents and first responders, and we pray your protection and blessing upon them. We ask that you would be with Dorothy in her fight with cancer. We pray that you would continue to work in Reddick's body, giving him health and strength. We pray for Brenda. We pray for Tammy and her fight with cancer. We pray for Bailey and her recovery. We pray for Carly. We just pray that you would help her body be healthy and cancer-free. 
We pray for strength and health for Andy and Betty Jo. We pray for Edna and her needs. We ask that you'd continue to be with Clara and her family. We pray that you would touch her body and her mind. We pray for Miles and Jacob. We pray for Aunt Marilyn and her coming travels. We pray for safety upon the road as she and Terry go home. We pray for Johnny's mother. We pray for Valir that you would meet her needs. Pray that you would touch her physically. We pray for Don and Patty and their travel, their family in this time of grief. We pray for Carlos and his family and their needs. We pray for Eric Cook. We pray for the Marlin family. We pray for the family of Joy Sewell. We pray for Dinah. We pray for April. We ask specifically that this tumor would shrink enough and that this blood clot would clear from April's body so that she might undergo surgery that would work healing. We ask today that you would be at work among the many unspoken prayer requests that have been indicated in your house this day. How we trust that you know the deep needs of our lives, those things we don't speak out loud, but now we whisper from our hearts to you. We thank you that you have heard us. We pray. We pray that you would increase our faith. Help us to see your hand at work in our world. And when we do, may we be quick to give you praise. All of these things, as well as your blessings upon the remainder of this service, our time of studying your word, we pray that you use it to build us up into the image and likeness of Christ to make our minds attuned to the Spirit. Help us to hear your voice, follow where you lead. To that end, we ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, I'm going to ask that you find the book of Matthew. That's going to be about two-thirds or three-fourths of the way through, depending upon your Bible. Matthew chapter 2. Of course, I guess if you're carrying the New Testament, it'll be right up toward the front, but um, those are inside jokes. You only get those if you've been in pews long enough, so. Second chapter of the book of Matthew, we find ourselves today, a day after, officially a day after, uh, the celebration of Epiphany. A day on the Christian calendar when we celebrate the coming of the Magi, the three wise men who came from afar. One of these days, I'm not saying when, if ever, but one of these days I have this dream about doing a crazy country Christmas program in which three little boys come running in the side door in firemen's outfits, the three wise guys from afar. And that's about the extent of my humor. That's why I'm a preacher and not a comedian. From Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, hear the word of the Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem and the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod 
secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent to them, he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Throughout the Christian era, January the 6th, has been celebrated as the Feast of Epiphany, remembering and celebrating the coming of the wise men, finding Jesus not in the stable. I know it makes for a great nativity scene. But did you hear they entered the house where he was staying? So apparently he had at least moved from the stable to a house, and probably if we take the rest of the Gospels into account, and probably just good sense, not in Bethlehem anymore, but back home in Nazareth. I still like the nativity scene with the three wise men, fire hats and all. We remember the day of Epiphany and the coming of these three wise men from the east, celebrated Magi, as Christ coming not only to be the Messiah of the Jews, but to be the Savior for the Gentiles. This at the very beginning of Jesus' life, before he enters into his adult period of ministry, while he's just a baby, is seen as revelatory of Christ coming to extend the invitation to be the people of God beyond the nation of Israel to the whole world. I suspect most of us here today are grateful that the net that incorporates the people of God got cast wider than the nation of Israel so that it would include all of us pale-skinned, Northwestern European types and African types and island types and Asian types and Eurasian types and Eastern Asian types and American first people types. You get the drift, right? All of us, Jew and Gentile alike, are invited to be part of the people of God through this Messiah, born in Bethlehem, Jesus of Nazareth. We celebrate the coming of the Magi, and we have questions, knowing clearly that they didn't come wearing firemen's hats. But who were they, and where did they come from? Christian tradition Early traditions give them names and locations. The interesting thing is that early Christian traditions don't necessarily give them the same names or speak of their origins with one voice. And so we're sort of left with what we hear in Matthew's gospel. They are three wise men from the east. Does that mean that they were from Persia, modern-day Iran? Christian tradition, some Christian traditions would say so. Were they 
three kings, maybe one from Shiva, Ethiopia, one from India, one from Persia. Some Christian tradition suggests this as well. Like many of the biblical stories that we aren't given enough information in Scripture to completely nail down the particulars, various people at various different times through history have cast the wise men in ways that included them. And how appropriate that those early Christian traditions would rise up and identify the origins of the wise men, these kings from afar, with places they knew, maybe places they were associated with or from themselves, in order to include themselves and their people in the great story of the birth of the Savior of the world. How appropriate that we continue to celebrate the coming of the Magi as foreshadowing the extension of salvation, incorporation into the people of God, to all the Gentile peoples of the world, i.e. all of those outside of the nation of Israel. Hmm. I think it's good. You want to have some fun sometime, Google the wise men and read about all the different traditions and how they have been used through history. You know, it's that first Sunday of the month and we have potluck, so I've decided that it's probably not prudent to go through all of those today and finish up about 8 o'clock tonight. I have always found one word in this particular passage very, very interesting. And I would like to muse upon it for a little bit with you this morning. We hear that when Herod heard the news that he was Translation in your pew Bible says frightened. I really appreciate an older translation in English that says he was troubled. And all of Jerusalem with him. Hmm. He was troubled. Imagine, imagine. Some random birth causing the king, Herod, serving as king, frankly, by favor with the Roman emperor. Secure in power, really secure in power because of his close ties with Rome. And suddenly we find Herod troubled. The story of Herod is really an ugly one. I'm not sure which parts of his story I find the most troubling. The idea of him dying by being consumed from the inside out with worms, some sort of parasite that caused him to die, or the fact that he killed one of his wives and had her embalmed in honey, and he, he kept her coffin in his bedroom so he could continue to see her in her honey bath. I'm not sure that I want to be called honey anymore. <laughs> or the number of potential rival kings from among his own sons that he had assassinated. Apparently Herod was troubled. <laughs> All the more so by the birth of an anonymous child somewhere in his country that he was made known about sort of by accident by the coming of wise men from the east who did exactly what prominent people of the day, maybe even royalty, 
or certainly high aristocracy would do, and that is they came to a foreign country, they entered the foreign country, they came to its capital city, and they sought an audience with the person who should know everything that's going on in their country, the king, who had no clue that the Messiah had been born. Don't feel too bad for Herod. Almost nobody else, probably besides Mary and Joseph, really knew. And maybe a few shepherds out in the Bethlehem fields who apparently got their word almost straight from the horse's mouth or the angel's wings. Herod was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. You know, most of you know, we have three preachers at Fly. We have your, whatever you want to call me, your Pastor James, Brother James, who, I don't know, I'm, I'm not even sure I like much titles anymore. Officially on paper, a lead pastor, but you know what? We got three great ministers here. I serve with two folks who I so love and appreciate. And I listen to them. You know, they preach from time to time. And I listen to them when they preach. Maybe because even the preacher needs to be preached to. <laughs> um, and one of our other ministers who I know quite well, my wife, who is right back there now doing an amazing job trying to introduce your children to Jesus. I, I hope that y'all appreciate how important a job she's doing. I dare say it's more important than the one I do. If we can succeed at introducing our little ones to Jesus early. Oh, the pain we can save them down the road. Amen. I don't know how many of you have made missteps in your life. Okay, all of you have. Me too. <laughs> For anybody that didn't come to know Jesus early and follow him faithfully, if you could do it all over again, wouldn't you want to? So, continue to pray that Michelle will be successful in her ministry to our children. Saving them, protecting them, helping them early to know and follow Jesus, to love him and serve him and be saved from all of that pain and guilt and looking back and saying, oh, what might have been? Trouble. A few months ago, in one of her sermons, Michelle made a statement. She made a statement somewhat off the cuff. I'm not even sure that, I'm not even sure she realized the impact it would have on me. Preaching's weird that way. I say things that I never said. You hear things, you hear me say things I never said. It's a weird thing about preaching. I've had people come up to me, call me a week later after sermon and say, you know, you said, and I'm going, no, I didn't, it's not in my notes, but I don't say that out loud because I know what's going on. I know what happens in the preaching time, and that is your ears are hearing not only my voices, but your heart is hearing the Holy Spirit. And those work together in some weird way. Do you like weird? Mystical, foolish. That's actually a scriptural word. You know the foolishness of preaching? Because what really should go on is the heart should hear the Holy Spirit while the ears are hearing the preacher and what the heart hears is what really matters anyway. So I never say, you know, I didn't say that. Unless, of course, it's something really stupid. And then I have to go back and listen to myself on the tape and see, did I say something stupid? 
Michelle made this statement. She said, Jesus challenged the way they served God. She was talking about the scribes and the Pharisees, and she made this statement. She said, Jesus challenged the way they served God. Herod was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Why? Because if the Messiah had really come, their world was about to change in ways they could not predict. Ways they could not control the power of God. They knew from their books of scripture, the prophecy of old, they knew that when the Messiah came, things were going to change. They had an idea about what that meant, but they weren't sure, but they did know that when the Messiah showed up, status quo was going to be out the dough. You like the way I made that rhyme? You can only do that in the South and get away with it. I'm not really sure about that, but we'll see. When I heard those words from Michelle, it troubled me. Because what the Holy Spirit said to me when I heard those words from Reverend Michelle was, how long has it been since Jesus threatened the way you serve God? How you like that for a preacher being preached to? How long has it been, my dear parishioners, since the coming of Jesus challenged the way we serve God? How long has it been since his coming was cause for trouble? I suggest to you this morning that it needs to challenge the way you serve God. I don't care if you've been serving him for 70 years. Jesus needs to challenge the way we serve God. He needs to give a little trouble to our lives, a little inconvenience, because, you know, serving him is never really that convenient. I find that the Spirit of God says to me, surrender and serve. And for some strange reason, while I find joy in serving Christ, while in so many ways I look at my life and my, my very makeup and the way my brain works and I go, I think God wired me to serve him. But I also worry that one can become comfortable with how he or she serves God. And I wonder... I just wonder if we allowed ourselves to be troubled if we wouldn't serve him better. If we listened, I mean really listened to the voice of the Spirit in 2024, would God ask us to do things for him that were Inconvenient, troubling, one of those synonyms of fear that bring trepidation, not sure we could do that, certain we wouldn't be comfortable with that. Here we are, 
the day after the Feast of Epiphany. That day when we celebrate that God came to us in Christ Jesus to extend salvation to the whole world. Your people and mine. And all of their people too. And when he came. In his wake. There was. Trouble. Not all trouble is bad. Dare I say a time or two, mom or dad, your child has uh, brought home somebody and you said, that's trouble. My mother-in-law is laughing. It's okay. She probably remembers that me at times when I was probably troubled. Maybe sometimes that turns out that that trouble was a good thing. Maybe sometimes when we allow ourselves to be troubled by God, inconvenienced by serving him, totally sold out, totally surrendered to doing what he asked us to do, we'll be a little fearful. We'll be a little troubled. And the aftermath will be God extends his kingdom. He offers the hand of salvation to maybe people outside our comfort zone. Maybe he calls us into a walk that means we have to let go of things that make us comfortable. And just trust him. Maybe, maybe as we start a new year in worship, what I'm trying to say is in the coming of the Magi, we see the, the heart of God to bring salvation to the whole world. In case you don't know it, be reminded that Every Islamic extremist on the planet is a soul God wants to save. Every, every bum walking the streets of Nashville is a soul God wants to save. Every prostitute working the night is a soul God wants to save. Every drug addict, every alcoholic, every person that doesn't share your ideas about how many genders were created is a soul God wants to save. But there are a lot of those people who are never going to be introduced to Jesus until we, his people, are a little troubled. Willing to step out of our comfort zone and extend the gospel to weird people who don't dress like us and don't come from around here. I don't know what the Holy Spirit might have said to you today during the foolishness of preaching. He might have said something like, well, I guess I'm going to have to, you fill in the blank. But he might have said something like, if I'm ever going to participate in what God wants to do in this world, I'm going to have to start working on what's going on inside of my heart.
Because every one of you sitting here today is also a soul God wants to save. So as we close our service this morning, I challenge you. What would God do in and through you this year? What bit of comfort and status quo might you have to let go to see his will done on earth as it is in heaven? And are you willing to let it begin with you? Let us pray. Our good and gracious God, who has chosen to make the gift of a Savior, not the Messiah of a single people, but the birthright of every human being. How I pray that here and now, with us in this place, the Spirit of God would come in power, enabling us to do the work of Christ in our world, beginning inside of each one of us and extending to the whole world. I pray that our hearts cry would be whatever amount of trouble it takes for me to be surrendered to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Bring it. And then I pray, give us the strength to walk where you lead, to follow where you would have us go, and to do what you would have us to do. Bless your people, not only this day, but in this coming year. Bless those here within the sound of my voice, how I pray that your will would be done first in us and then in our world, just as it is in heaven, and that we would endure whatever trouble to see it done. Bless now, I pray, those who have come into your house. May the blessing outfit for each one for their coming days and for this year. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. A reminder, it's that Sunday when potluck is here. And you should stay and eat and enjoy and fellowship.